So each one of these groups is a group in and of its own right. right? Each of them is a group of six elements. Um, and one of the things that will also help us to understand abstract structure is to be able to look for structures within structures. This is something that you did in linear algebra. Once you learned what a vector space was in linear algebra, you also asked the question, all right, can I find smaller vector spaces that live within my bigger subspa uh, vector spaces? Right? You called those vector subspaces. Same thing in Math 180. You learn what sets are, and then you start embarking on looking for subsets within larger sets. Right? Um, same story here, that once we know what groups are, and we do after chapter two, um, we also want to be able to find within larger groups, smaller groups, potentially smaller function composition. So um, here's a question. Let's just go to D3 for a minute. And I want to ask the question, if I were to take just two out of my six elements, let's say I just take the subset. So I want to be real careful here to say the subset, I'm going to call it uh, S, which has just the elements I and R squared. So I just pick those two elements out of my six. And the question I have is, does this subset of elements form a group of its own? Is it a group? What do you think? What properties would it have to satisfy in order to qualify as a group? Same price, the same cost of admission, right? Uh, the, same, uh, the same subway token that a group has to put in, a subgroup also has to put in before it can get on the subway. Um, so those are associativity. Will associativity be satisfied in this subset? How do we know for sure without even lifting our pencil that associativity will be satisfied? There's yeah. only two elements. Well, there's only two elements. Mm. Yeah, and one of them is the identity. So that's, it would make the computation we'd have to do to just directly prove that associativity holds and make it really quickly. But I want to do this without even picking up a pen. I pulled these elements out of D3. What is D3? It's a group. So what does it satisfy? The operation of the group D3 is an associative operation because D3 is already a group. Right? And so for any three elements of D3 that I choose, I write down the associative law, and that associative equation law would be true. Right? And so that will remain true if two of the elements that I pick are taken from this subset. Right? So the fact that the operation in my big group was associative will automatically guarantee that the operation on any <laughs> subset of those elements, the same operation, right, uh, will still be associative. So associativity is always inherited. You never have to check that one, fortunately. Another reason we don't worry as much about associativity failing. Ah, that's, that's where I'm going with this, right? Um, what about the other properties? So let's take, um, I don't know, identity property. Is the identity property satisfied by this subset? What is the identity element in this subset? Yeah. So it has my identity element. So now you can imagine if I had chosen a different subset, maybe I just chose T and R, right? How would the story be different? There'd be no identity element, right? So one of the things that we notice is that for sure, a subgroup, in order to be a group in and of its own right, it must contain the identity element from the big group. The group's identity. So this one passes that test, at least. Right? It has the identity element from the original group. Uh, all right, what about inverses? What's the inverse of i in D3? It's i. And so it, you know, i has an inverse in my set. What's the inverse of r squared in D3? What do I multiply r squared by to cancel it and turn it into the identity? R. What do we conclude from that? Aha. Uh -huh. So R squared has an inverse in the original group, because the original group had the inverse property. But that inverse didn't come with it into the smaller subset. And that's a problem. That means that this smaller subset by itself cannot be a group, because R squared will not have an inverse in this group. So R squared has no inverse in 
S. It had an inverse in the original group, but that inverse did not survive, didn't make it into the subset. So already, we have to make a conclusion, right? That this subset does not, in fact, form a group of its own. Um, but just for kicks, let's discuss that last property. What is it? Closure. Closure. Is this set of two elements a closed set under the operation of this group? If I combine i with r squared, I get r squared, both left and right. If I combine r squared with itself, r squared times r squared is going to give me it's going to give me r to the fourth, which is equal to r to the first, which again was not an element in my subset. So closure was also violated here, because r squared was an element of s, r squared also an element of s, but when I combine them together, I get r to the fourth, which is the same as r, which doesn't belong to s. So closure got violated, inverse got violated. So this example of a subset is a subset of elements, yes, but not every subset of elements gets to be a subgroup. In order to be a subgroup, um, we have to have all four of these properties satisfied, um, just like we did for a regular group. So what we'll say is here that S is not a subgroup of D3. Can we fix this problem? Yes, if you add R to S. Let's just toss that R in there. R seemed to be the one problem here, right? That if we didn't have the R, we weren't going to get these properties satisfied. So if I throw R in here as well, and I ask these same questions. Now let me not call it S, let me call it T or something, right? We still have associativity that gets inherited from the group. We still have the identity property. Now what's the inverse of R squared? What's the inverse of R? Remember, inverses always come in that buddy system, right? Um, if I'm your inverse, then you're my inverse, because left and right inverses are, you know, have to be both left and right. Um, OK, so the inverse property is now satisfied. We can directly check that everything has an inverse in my subset. Uh, how about closure? If I multiply i by anything, it's going to remain. If I multiply r by r squared or by itself or r squared by itself, those are just going to give me other powers of r, either identity or r or r squared. So closure will be satisfied. And all four of these being satisfied, we now will say that T is, in fact, a subgroup of D3. So one of the most important things I wanted to impress upon you early, and the notation we use, by the way, is like a subset symbol, except that it's pointy. Um, or you can think of it as a less than sign, but I don't, I don't like that because it kind of sounds like it's a value judgment. Um, but T is a subgroup of D3. And what I wanted to impress right away was that subgroup is a different question than subset. If you just randomly select some elements uh, out of a bigger group, we're not necessarily going to get a subgroup out of that, right? Because we need all four of these properties to still be satisfied. We need it to still be a setting in which we can do abstract algebra, simplify expressions, and solve equations. Um, of course, and this is what I'll leave you with, verifying all four of these properties in general is kind of a burden. Um, and so what we'd like to be able to do is to use the structure that already exists in the larger groups to help us to verify that something is a subgroup without having to check all four of these things uh, in turn. And so what you're going to learn about in the videos over the weekend uh, is a series of what are called subgroup tests. It's really a, a set of three theorems uh, that give us sort of checkable criteria in either one step or two steps rather than four steps to determine whether or not something, some subset uh, of the elements of a group forms a subgroup or not. Um, there are three of them, uh, a one-step test, a two-step test, and what's called a finite subgroup test. Um, getting conversant with all three of them is nice. It'll also give you a good opportunity to practice uh, writing proofs. Um, ultimately, at the end of the day, um, I tend to gravitate toward the simplest one, which is the one-step subgroup test, but they're all, they're all ways of getting you to the same conclusion. You hand me a subset, I apply one of these tests to it, and it will tell me is this subset a subgroup or not.